Hi guys, thanks for coming, appreciate it. Um, very in intimidating bunch of folks staring at me right now, so hopefully we, we do ourselves justice here. Um, uh, not sure the types or characteristics of the presentations that you're gonna be seeing or you've been seeing over the course of the field day and, and gonna to continue to see. The way we decided we thought it might make sense is to kind of go through a progression of, of cumulus networks and, and the kind of trying to impart upon you mostly philosophical perspectives, what, what we think you know, makes us who we are you guys decide whether A, that's interesting, and B, whether that sets us apart. That's, that's you know, where you get to come to some conclusion. But for us, we're gonna try to do our best of telling you what's important to us. Uh, we'll start with an overview. The, it's not so much a, hey, this is Cumulus Linux overview, the dumb product pitch, it's more of um, what, are, what are the things that we think about as we make our steps? What, do we, what got us to where we're at today? What do we think about when we pick the next feature or the next uh, technology that we embark upon? Um, Dinesh is going to talk a little bit about data center architectures. Uh, most of these are pretty familiar to you guys, so I don't think there's going to be much rocket science here. In fact, I don't think he's going to spend very much time on that. But he's really going to talk to you about the things that we worry about when we see these data center architectures, what kind of goes through our heads. Matt Peterson is going to talk to you guys about uh, kind of the transformation to what we call the cloud admin. It's, a, it's something that we believe is occurring. Uh, it's an inevitability. And the both the, the kind of drivers that we see in the market as well as what we're doing to help enable people become cloud admins, whether they're coming from the network side or they're coming from the sysadmin side, they all in, inevitably be, you know, kind of converge in that spot. And then at the end, David Sin's going to talk about uh, kind of a bunch of real world use case examples, um, both from his perspective as well as some other customers that we've engaged with. Obviously, you guys will speak up when you feel like it. You'll ask questions. We have two hours. We have you know four speakers, so you know we don't have tremendous amount of time to delve into things in depth. So there might be points in time where I say, "Hey, can we take that offline?" Or you know, perhaps this is a great idea for a follow up in a, in a potential blog post or something as we go on. So uh, now I, I fidget when I talk, so I have to stand up if that's okay with the camera. Um, the uh, you know, the thing I want to start with is you know, I was you know, lucky enough to be involved in C Cisco for a really, really long time. And when I got into networking, it was very much a hardware-oriented world. Um, hardware defined the size of things you could build. You know, the, every chip had a certain function was different. The, the Mac chip was different than the Serdes chip, which was different than the Phi and all of these things. Um, technology became more and more mature. The, the pieces of networking that we cared about became smaller and smaller, meaning you know, we didn't have to worry about token ring and Apple talk and all these other things. We could condense it down. Ethernet kind of dominates right now. You know, we used to do IPX. I mean, some of you guys are probably old enough to remember that protocol. Some of you were young enough, young enough to be thankful to never have to know it. Um, but the, uh, you know, the world has kind of converged around IP and it's trying to get to IPv6 you know, slowly but surely, but, and maybe it will get there someday. Uh, anyways, the, the technology's matured itself as things have, have advanced forward. And what I started noticing in, in my career is that people want, needed to be, build bigger and bigger systems. And you know, I got lucky enough to be involved in, in Google as they started building their networking equipment. And the, the fundamental driver for them was that they needed affordable capacity. So part, a good part of it was a CapEx play, no doubt. That was roughly about 50% of it. The other 50% was they needed to be able to build their operational environment around a well-understood set of building blocks. Okay, they didn't want to go to a vendor and say, hey, give me the whole answer. They wanted to, give, they wanted to be able to have a building block that was not only something they could build around with, but they could have parallel teams working on building it. Um, I left Google and went to, to a little startup called Nuova Systems and became responsible for system architecture for the unified computing system. And um, don't know how many of you are familiar with that platform, but the, the underpinnings of it are, are basically a bunch of Linux endpoints. Um, the, there, there's this really cool management layer, it's called UCS Manager. It kind of hides all the, all, everything from the, the users, but underneath it all, it's really just a bunch of little Linux endpoints running all the same operations that you might run if you're building a little mini data center. Pretty straightforward. Um, it ends up that, from my perspective, actually not from, in general for the team, the hardest element to interact with was NXOS. Even though it was hosted on Linux, it by itself was not Linux. In fact, you know, a little known fact is that in, on a UCS, a fabric, uh, what do they call it, fabric interconnect now in UCS terms, um, there's 
two IP stacks. There's the Linux IP stack that UCS Manager uses, and there's the Cisco NXOS IP stack that they've done, which is totally different than the, the native uh, Linux IP stack. Pretty crazy architectural you know, uh, partitioning there. But where I was getting at is, in the end, we were able to build this system up from a bunch of well-known building blocks using things that people could develop with um, in isolation, super loosely coupled, but then present to, to somebody as a single interface. That was important to the Cisco customer set. Um, that set of principles is one of the things that drove us, you know, both Nolan and myself and a lot of the other people here, to Cumulus Networks and Cumulus Linux. We want to provide this building block that people can use to build great network systems. It's completely fair to you to come up to me and say, hey, JR, where's your like, overall kick-ass network management platform? And I'm going to say, sorry, we don't do that. We don't do that because network management platforms, in my experience, and I've been around these things for a long time, as some of you have, um, typically take on a flavor. And they appeal to a set of people. They're not a fundamental enabler. So someone will consume it. You can build a great network management platform. UCS Manager is an example. Some people absolutely love it. It's right up their alley. Whole nother set of people have zero interest in it having exist in their, in their life. So from a cumulus perspective, we're not trying to give you that this is our network management platform for the fabric. What we're trying to give you is here is a great building block for networking. It's great today. We will continue to enhance it. It will get, you know, in our opinion, greater and greater and greater over time. Use it as a building block. Some of our customers build their own orchestration platforms out of it. So some of them have their own network virtualization overlay solutions and internal monitoring systems and all that sort of stuff. Others of our customers use it somewhat minimally and they use kind of standard monitoring tools, light, we'll call it lightweight automation and orchestration. It's whatever meets the architectural and operational mindset of the customer. We're trying to build, provide a great building block. Today, we're at a point where we have you know, kind of the, the requisite set of L2 and, and L3 features, bridging, routing, IPv4, v6, all that kind of stuff. And Dinesh will get into that more later. Um, the, the foundation of the platform, I think most of you know, is fundamentally and unashamedly Linux. Okay, That is, in our mindset, the, the, the lingua franca of the data center. And that's what we're driving at. Uh, one question that comes up oftentimes, and I think some of the, and the people in the room may, may have posed it themselves along the way, is what happens to the network admin? What happens to my CCAE, goddammit? This thing is freaking awesome. I spent a lot of money on it. Um, and from my perspective, I'm absolutely glad that you spent a lot of money on it. It's a good thing for you, right? When you, when you got that certification, you learned two things. You learned how networking should work, what you should expect. What is IPv6? What is DHCP relay? What are all these behaviors and characteristics that the world has decided are interesting in, in building operationalized data centers? All right. But you also then learn how to make, type it in to make it work the Cisco way. We try as much as possible when, whenever we're kind of overlapping to not change how it works. We may kind of, we'll call it advance the state of the art, but we don't try and go back and say, hey, we're going to make networking work architecturally super different than you know, because most people can't consume that. They don't, it's not an understood building block. They don't know how to move forward with it. We try to keep that part the same. We have absolutely changed the what you type. You know, in some cases, the what you type is turned into a set of bash commands or a set of quagga configs. They get, it gets more and more elegant as you go, which you'll hear throughout the day how we've made it easier and easier through various ways. But in the end, everybody gets to go back to those fundamental building blocks from bash. Um, again, the reason we chose that, kind of back to the, the cloud admin perspective, every cloud deployment I've been involved with, even the ones at Microsoft, of all people, deploy a reasonably large amount of Linux. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Linux is clearly the lingua franca of the cloud. You can build on top of it, but that's what you need to be un you know, underneath it. Um, that, that path for us has been super powerful. Um, I think I've heard this question posed before, um, maybe some people in the room, but definitely in the blogger kind of influencer sphere. Hey, you guys have the same partners everybody else has. Well, yeah, because there's only so many people in the industry. You know, it's not a small industry. But with that said, you know, our partner list uh, in general are people that, if actually I think pretty much across the board with maybe one or two uh, nuances in there, are, are partners that we have uh, either a very deep trial or production deployment with. 
So these aren't just people that, you know, there are companies, that, as you all know, you track startups, they do the logo swap. Hey, I'll swap my logo for your logo and we'll be cool partners, right? So we've taken the tact of not doing that. We have a, a woman named uh, Mina Sonkrum. She's our technology uh, partnership alliance manager. She is super brutal. You don't get on the partner list unless we do something serious with you at a customer. We'll talk a lot and we'll work together. We'll do integrations and all that stuff, but we don't show up together unless we've done something real. Um, we're able to do this. We're a small company. There's not millions of us. You guys are, are, I mean, there's this office, there's the San Francisco office, and there's Raleigh. So it's not like there's a, you know, a, you know, 200,000 people here working at the company. We can get this partner list because it's easy for our partners to work with us. They all understand what does it mean to work with a Linux endpoint. Most of their systems are founded around Linux. They're able to use virtual machines and, and, other, you know, and, and images and other techniques so that they can, do, they can work separately from us, very loosely coupled. We can work separately from them. When we integrate, the integrations are efficient and fast. Another thing that's really important for us on the, on the enabling front is open source. Seems pretty bizarre to think about it. I mean, the, the networking industry in general has not been super open source friendly. Uh, Nolan and I, when we started the company, we, we recognized that this is the way the world is going, especially around networking. The hardware tech technology is extremely mature. Um, routing stacks like Quag and Bird exist. They may not be perfect, but they exist. Um, so, you know, there's people here in the building that have written six network operating systems and that have generated you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of revenue to their end customers. They know we could write a network operating system from scratch if we wanted to. We'd be very successful at it. It just doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is to recognize that these bodies of work exist. They, they have pretty reasonable foundations. We can improve them and move them forward. So that's how, looking at it from the technology side. When you step on, on the other half of the, of the curve, you say, what does that look like from the business side? So you have to recognize that if this is what's happening on technology, i.e. hardware is becoming grossly industry standard, there are a lot of open source you know, kind of industry standard technologies that are available, what's the business look like that can deliver that to customers? And so that's what we spend a lot of time strategizing around. It's not, hey, cool, I can do this bitching thing in Quagga. It's what does a business look like that can successfully last, that can come out of this whole thing and deliver this type of technology to our customers? And that's where we spend a lot of time thinking about and focusing. Right? So we, you know, oss.cumulusnetworks.com, super dumb thing. If you have open source components in your, in your products and you distribute them, <laughs> most of the open source licenses have two requirements. One is that the copyright gets distributed with, the, with the, the distribution, the code download that you get. It ends up, if you do a survey of, of major networking vendors, none of them do that. We just recently came across a license issue with one of our customers that they noticed that we had a particular uh, a, a piece of code in our, our library in our, uh, in our distribution with a license they weren't happy with. So we went through, we fixed it for them, but then we did a survey of all the all the other gear that they're using today, and it ends up all that other gear had that same license exposure, but nobody else told the customer about that. Cumulus Linux, there's a license file right on the box. Every box, every image, you can download it, you can look inside it, all the open source licenses are listed. If you patch something, most open source licenses require that you, uh, that you make those patches available to your customers. OSS.cumulusnetworks.com, everything that we've patched in every release goes up there. <coughs> because that's what you do in this industry. This is how the community exists. We do that. Go to most of your other incumbent vendors. Don't take that step. Most of them hack up a lot of open source software. You can get access to their, their patches if you dig around hard enough and long enough as a customer, but it's really a mental mindset. They're not, they don't have zero interest in making it available or reasonable. In our case, we're saying this is what our duty is. This is we're building a business around this. This is the expectations of that business. Uh, github.cumulusnetworks.com or github.cumulusnetworks. Uh, that's where we put projects that we kind of grossly conceive of. Most of the time, the work that we do is in the context of existing communities. It's kind of a, a I, I've kind of skipped over that perspective. And when people look at open source, it's really easy for me to write a bunch of code that's super complex and there's eight of us in the world that understand and throw it up on GitHub and said, hey, I've got this really cool open source project. I am in the community. Okay. It's really hard to maintain that over time. It's oftentimes very uninteresting to customers. How many of you have heard of Floodlight, the really cool open source uh, SDN controller? 
that hasn't been contributed to in two years. I saw it on a slide set yesterday as an interesting open flow use, uh, usage. It hasn't been contributed to in two years. The only people that ever contributed to were Big Switch. Super complex. That's not interesting. What's interesting is when you can leverage a community, find a community that's doing something, and make that community better. So we work with communities like Quagga and, and Open Source Writing Foundation, the Linux Foundation around the Linux kernel networking stack. We spend a lot of time in the bowels of existing projects to make that stuff better. I know you've got like your own, like, you know, you say patches to Quagga and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, you're not, you don't want to maintain your own forks of those for too long. If you if exactly you ever, right, you're yeah. trying to push everything back up into mainstream. Yes, I mean, yeah, as much as oh, they've got to accept it, right? But yeah. You know, but yeah, that's, and that's, that's a tremendous amount of work. The preference is to get it back into their mm -hmm. main line. Right. I mean, that's, it, it takes a tremendous amount of work. And it, again, it's a, a, a philosophical perspective. That's what sets us apart from most of the other vendors in this space is it's our, we're leveraging this code base. It's our responsibility to take the enhancements and move it back upstream. You know, from a businessman's perspective, hey, hey we've invested dollars in this thing. I want to keep it to myself. But that's not what you know, the community signed up for. The community signed up for us doing this. And how do we make a business that makes sense with that, the knowledge that that upstream transfer is going to occur? How do we make sure that really smart people are involved in that? So as an example, Dinesh Dutt is our chief scientist. Right now, he's working on an upstream merge of a bunch of our Quagga patches. Super, you know, huge amount of work. And it's not some intern, you know, that's, you know, still in high school that kind of hacks Python periodically. This is somebody that actually knows the stuff and wrote most of the patches oh, or cool. a good number of the patches. I've, you know, I've uh, been using Quagga for some other, and some other pieces, you know, it's, uh, it's not a competing product or such or anything like that. And it will benefit from those, those improvements coming back in. So. It will. And likewise, uh, our customers benefit from other people's work. So we, you know, that's part of the community and, and that's why it's interesting in the, the transition that's occurring right now in the networking spaces, we talk a lot about Quagga because it's, it's kind of important to us. There's a bunch of people contributing to it. We're not the only ones sticking stuff in. And so all of our customers jointly benefit from our cross work. So we're able to leverage the kind of the development and uh, analysis and QA skills of you know, thousands of people, it's not just Cumulus networks. I guess there's also the, um, you know, like some uh, companies that have used open source components have um, just leached off other people as such. Or, or, if you, know, you know what I mean? They don't yeah. really contribute back in. It. Right. And it's, it's kind of sad, really, when, when they do that. But, so it's, it's good to see those are, yeah, be, be coming back through. Right. Well, yeah. it's, it's a struggle that many companies go through. Mm. Um, whoops, I skipped it certainly over changes the, the support model. There's no question about that. I mean, for the... For the for the equipment, it changes the support model because you're also supporting the, the back-end software. Well, in the end, I mean, that's, that's a great phrasing and, and way of thinking about it. There's two things that customers look at, at us for. There's little bits and pieces of things that, that are in Cumulus Linux distribution that are proprietary. Mm -hmm. Some of them are proprietary for um, kind of licensing reasons with um, other partners where we, we just can't open source it. Um, others of them are realistically the code is um, I'll call it ugly enough that if you put it, you could put it up there, but it's going to change so much. And if people started dabbling around with it, it would get, it, it's just not tractable as, a, as an open source effort. Um, but we try to keep those pieces as small as possible. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we actively try to figure out how those become less and less and less cumulus specific, less proprietary. Right. Example is there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a BOF going, actually not even a BOF, it's a working group going on in, in the far reaches of Canada right now around uh, switching device drivers in the Linux kernel. And we have like four people that are up there right now working on that, which seems like completely antithetical to our business goals. But again, it's part of what we signed up for when we started. Oh, Matt's telling me I got to keep myself on track here. Um, you know, one of the things that again, sets us apart is the, the, the scope of the hard, our hardware partnerships. There's, there's the ones that you can find on the HCL today. And then, you know, I think you'll see over the course of the next couple months, you'll see a, a, a few others coming on that are extremely notable. The, the big observation here is that companies that we're working with are taking a, a different look at their system IT purchasing decision tree when they're building out cloud data centers. Oftentimes what they want to do is go to a set of companies that can help them deliver, call it a full stack of products, compute, storage, networking, hardware. 
they generally expect those companies are not going to have deep expertise in any of those dimensions. People that go by, I mean, I'm going to pick on Dell, but people that go to Dell to buy a server don't expect Dell to be the recognized expert in how Ceph works in Red Hat. That's Red Hat's job, that's not Dell's job. But they do expect that the Dell server and the disks that they get from Dell will work well in a Ceph environment because Red Hat told them it would. Okay, same thing's true in the context of Cumulus Linux. <coughs> Dell, you know, Michael Dell himself made, you know, we, we had a, it's kind of a cool story. He sent me this LinkedIn invite. We turned into a phone call, you know, about 20 minutes later. And, uh, and we're talking on the phone and he, what are you doing at Cumulus, blah, blah, blah. I tell him the whole thing. And he goes, okay, I get it, I get it. What's wrong with my networking business? I just spent a bunch of money, I bought Force 10, it's you know, going for me. Tell me what's wrong with my networking business. And I don't know where it came from, but I said, Michael, right now you make customers like your software to buy your hardware. And you don't do that in the server world. And he goes, stops for about a minute or so, and he says, you're right. You're gonna get contacted in about a half hour. We need to work something out. And that was the foundation of the relationship we had with Dell. It was that fast that he recognized that the world was changing. He's hearing that from other customers, and someone finally kind of phrased it to him in a way that resonated with him, and he was able to move on. But that's the buying pattern that we're seeing occurring in the market today. And as an enabler, it's not our job to pick who the winners and losers are. As an enabler, our job is to make sure that everybody that wants to play has, is kind of on as, as even a playing field as possible. Last thing I'm going to cover is what does it mean to our customers? How do we help them out? Um, I know you've probably heard from some of our, uh, the industry leaders that, hey, it's, you know, one of them phrased it, actually one of the customers was told by one of these, these guys to phrase it like Home Depot. It's like going to Home Depot and buying two by fours and, and wrenches and stuff like that. And, and you'll figure it out yourself and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, realistically, that's not what it's about. What we've done is we believe that the structure of networking software suppliers will change. And we are trying to make ourselves into the next generation networking software supplier. What people expect out of them, the number one thing people expect out of them is stuff that works. Not stuff that you can cobble together, but stuff that works. And you understand what you can do, you understand what you can't do. If you say you can do something and I don't understand how it works or it's not working right, I need you to fix it for me now. So we have a, like a world-class support team, a bunch, you know, a real, very world-class support team in Raleigh, North Carolina. These guys not only take support tickets, but they write knowledge-based articles. They work on customer uh, trials and demos and stuff like that. So they get a lot of hands-on time on the, on the product itself, as well as the peripheral technologies in the data center, Ansible and Puppet and Nagios and Collecti. And all, they, they're touching all these things. You know, one of the guys is setting up our Mitakura demo. And so they, they know all the technologies. They know how to put it together. So when a customer trips over something, it's, they're not just talking to some robot, they're talking to somebody that understands the technology, there's familiarity with what the customer's likely going through. Okay, we spend a lot of time on things like solution guides. Our solution guides are pretty, I don't know if you've seen them, the, the, when we did the 2.5 release, we just put three solution guides around vSphere, OpenStack, and Big Data. Take a look at them if you haven't. We think that they're pretty inclusive. We tend to not just say, hey, here's how you set up the network, but it's here, how, it's this is how you set up the network, this is how you image the servers, this is how you bring up the whole thing. So we take you soup to nuts. You literally can go on, on grab a bunch of bare metal hardware, servers, storage, and, and network, and from the solution guide, get a, an OpenStack deployment going, or get a vSphere deployment going, or get a, a, a Hadoop big data deployment going. Are those validated design guides available for non-customers? Yeah, they're on their website right now. And in addition to that, we have, we have this thing called the, the customer workbench. It's an environment where you know, a, a customer can come in and say, okay, this Cumulus thing, I heard about it, I'm slightly curious, what do I do? Well, come and take a look at this workbench. We set you up, you can have two switches or four switches or you know, four switches and a bunch of hosts, whatever the right environment for you to mess around with is. But it's a way for you can kind of come, try this stuff out risk-free, we have uh, on, uh, labs, instructor-driven labs once a week for these things. There's online labs you can do by yourself. All the solution guides have demos associated with them, so you can go in and say, all right, vSphere, show me the money. You can hit the go button, it blows out the whole vSphere you know, automation suite, and then you can go through and look and see all the things that happened. What, is it, what did it look like after the fact? So instead of me typing things in or figuring out how to script it or whatever, what did someone else do? All those demos are on GitHub, so you can go get those demo frameworks. 
They provide the foundation of automation frameworks for people. Again, Puppet or Ansible or whatever you, you choose to use. I think Matt, Matt's going to do one of these for you and not show you the nitty gritty or the, the, the small level details, but give you the extent of here's bare metal and here's the finished product and maybe poke you around a few things along the way. So the takeaway from that I want you to have is that Cumulus Networks is what we believe is different from us is as an as a up and comer uh, disruptor in a market that's filled with you know mega scale multi billion dollar companies, we have to do things different and we have to be an enabler. So in general, when you look at things coming out of us and say you could do so much more, oftentimes yeah we know we could do that, but we don't believe that that's our spot in the world. That's somebody else's spot in the world. And there's probably somebody that we're working with to enable just what you're asking for, right now. So. With no further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dinesh. Anybody have any questions? That was easy. <laughs> you guys are lightweights. I thought you were going to be pounding on me. <laughs> we're just getting warmed up. Okay, it's thanks. Soon. So right. let, let's just say that you didn't say anything that I wouldn't agree with. Okay. <laughs> I'll cross my fingers. 